there, world changers. Welcome to another episode of the How to Save the World podcast, where we'll be learning from some of the world's most interesting people about how you can turn your dreams for a better world into real and measurable change. Today's guest on the show is Stephen Lezak. He is an environmental geographer and a research psychologist. And he has recently published a paper in the Journal of Environmental Psychology titled Systems, Thinking and Environmental Concern, where he investigated, to put it simply, what happens when someone thinks about climate change and the environment. We are going to be talking about why people who engage in a systems thinking style are more concerned about the environment and what we can do to help grow our capacity for being better systems thinkers. Thanks so much for joining me on the show today, Stephen. Can we start by you explaining what systems thinking means to you? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for having me here, Katie. The easiest way to talk about systems thinking is a way of approaching the world where you see cause and effect as sometimes having a more complicated relationship. Oftentimes, it's very easy to think of the world as input and output and not a lot of stuff happens in between. But the systems thinking mindset, which is something that all of us have to some degree, some people use it more than others, is a way of approaching problems and problem solving that says maybe the relationship between two things could be sensitive, or maybe it's non-linear, or maybe it's out of proportion. The whole idea of tipping points, or discontinuities, or dynamic equilibrium, These are all of the things that are sort of in the toolkit of a systems thinker, where we don't just see the landscape of problems as this large, flat area with big, hunking blocks of problems that slowly push against each other. But rather, it's much more of a sort of roller coaster with triggers, kind of Rube Goldberg version of the world. There was recently an article that was done about your work, and I'm just going to read out a sentence from it because I thought this was really interesting, where the, the, the writer said, more and more attempts to explain why people behave the way they do in politics have turned away from the actual substance of the issue and towards the traits of the individuals themselves, which is this whole area of environmental psychology, which is reasonably new. I feel like psychology has been a relative newcomer to the environmental movement. Why do we need to study psychology when addressing our biggest environmental issues? Uh, It's such a good question. What we are finding increasingly, historically we've approached environmental issues and popular support for environmental interventions as this very sort of, oh, we we just need to teach people kind of model. And sometimes we call it an information deficit model that the public doesn't know something, and if we can get the right graph in front of them and explain it in the right way, then it's gonna click. And once it clicks, they'll be on board, and they'll understand, oh yes, of course, climate change is happening, we need to pursue these mitigation strategies, and you know, it'll be good. What we found over the last however many decades of working around issues like climate change or acid rain before that, or whatever environmental issue you want to point at, is that that is rarely the case. It rarely works out quite like that. And psychology has begun to give us a certain set of tools to pick apart this question of why doesn't it work like that? Certain research psychologists have run studies that have been as simple as let's get dozens of people together for a weekend, just normal people off the street. We will give them complex and and nuanced and contemporary information on climate change, for example. And we'll spend a whole weekend explaining it and having them talk about it. And we'll see how much their ideas about climate change shift over, you know, 16 hours of intensive education. What these researchers find is that absolutely there's a shift. If someone walks into the room on Saturday morning and says, I just don't believe in this stuff, They probably walk out Sunday afternoon and say, okay, yeah, maybe. I think I'm on board. But when you follow up with them six months later, they're right back to where they started. It's deeply disconcerting. Right, and they don't, the thing is that they don't change their behaviors. That's the thing, right? Is that they They change their mind, but not the behaviors. Well, but even if they change their mind, it's an impermanent shift. It's just temporary. And so obviously they're not going to change their behavior. Or if they do, you know, maybe they'll recycle for the first week or two. But they're not about to start heating their house to a different temperature. 
or go on fewer long haul vacations. So absolutely, you're right. It's not translating into behavior. And this is where psychology has jumped in and it's tried to say, okay, what's going on behind the scenes here? Maybe there's something that is happening inside people's minds where it's not just, you know, this brain in a jar where we give it information and it absorbs it and suddenly someone knows something, but maybe there are much more complicated systems at play. And so what are the problems that you think environmental organizations, city sustainability managers, people working in CSR, environmental engineers, everyone who's trying to make the world better? I mean, what what is the current problem they're facing where they're completely in the dark about environmental psychology? I think the single biggest problem is that we have all of these brilliant, talented folks who are specialists in their field who know the ins and outs of technological approaches. They know the ins and outs of green finance. They know backwards and forwards, different policy mechanisms to implement. And they just are not able to get the public support that they need to push these issues through. At the end of the day, city councilors and legislators are accountable to their voters. Their voters are not on board with the really interesting and dynamic and cutting edge policies that are being put forward. So we can draw up a carbon tax 19 different ways and each one can be more innovative than the next. But unless you have a coalition of the willing, you're never going to get it anywhere beyond the drafting board. What you're saying is that we really know how to create a sustainable planet. I I mean, I'm an environmental engineer. I've been studying this stuff all my life. I mean, we know that we need to put in, you know, cover the world in solar panels. And you see these graphs that are like, We only need to cover this tiny little part of Africa with solar panels and that would power the whole world. We know actually how to do it. But it seems that the big wall that we're up against now is where this field of environmental psychology is coming in. It's like, okay, we know what we need to do now. And that's what we're pushing against, which is where this really interesting field and all these sort of new findings are coming out. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Because the environmental engineers and the technologists and the policymakers, they're talking at the public, but they're not getting through. Even in the most sort of drummed up and exciting moments, you have Al Gore and An Inconvenient Truth or the, uh, the Leonardo DiCaprio movie from last year. What was it? Before the Flood. These huge, huge efforts to engage with people that are having mixed results. Absolutely mixed results. And what was the big thing that you found from your study that you did on people's capacity for systems thinking? What was the big insight that came out of that? The first thing to understand is is we came into an interesting and already quite developed field where psychologists really all over the world have been looking at, okay, what makes people tick in terms of environmental issues and specifically climate change? And we saw an opportunity to introduce something that had not been studied yet. People had been looking at, for example, how does your pro-ecological disposition, you know, basically how much of a tree hugger you are, how does that influence your attitudes about climate change? Or how does your belief in conspiracy theories influence your attitudes about climate change? And, and we said, okay, these are great and important and interesting, but we wonder if we might be able to get a totally new angle here. We ran some experiments looking at systems thinking as sort of a habit of mind that people have and how that can predict someone's concern about environmental issues. And you found that people that were more natural, if that's the best word to use, system thinkers were more sensitive to climate change and sustainability, right? That is absolutely right. And why do you think that is? I think it's a beautiful example of systems thinking, climate changes, in the most sort of textbook terms. So I'm going to tell you that there is this invisible, odorless, tasteless, colorless gas. You've never seen it. You've never felt it. You never will see it or feel it. It is so rare in the atmosphere that we talk about it in terms of parts per million. But it's out there. You just have to trust me. And I'm going to tell you that it is changing the ecosystem of every part of every continent on the planet. And you're gonna say, hold on, there's this thing. You're telling me I can't see it, I can't taste it, I can't touch it, and it is having a massive influence upon the planet? The earth is this huge thing, and there's this tiny gas that comes out of the tailpipe of my car. There's no way 
that that is influencing glaciers and the oceans and everything else. I feel like it sounds a bit like Fox News where uh, the guy goes, carbon dioxide is ridiculous. You know what carbon dioxide is? And then he goes, <sighs> like, that's carbon dioxide. That's and if you're listening on the podcast, I'm just breathing out like, <sighs> Um, this is ridiculous, as if oh, I can do anything. Anyway, that's just what it, what well, the story and is. The perfect example is, is United States Senator Jim Inhofe, who I believe chairs the Senate Committee on Energy and the Environment, or Energy and Natural Resources. It was January. He brings a snowball the to snowball the guy. floor of the Senate. <laughs> and he says, obviously, climate change is a hoax. Obviously, it's a hoax. And, and that's compelling to people. Obviously, this guy, mm. knows, this guy knows marketing. He's a United States senator. You don't get to be a United States senator by being a bad communicator. And he's there holding a snowball, and then he throws it onto the Senate floor into the middle of the chamber. And everyone's like, yeah, okay, climate change is a hoax. So that's what we're up against. That's what we're up against. We need to tell people that there's this tasteless, odorless, colorless gas while, while Senator Inhofe has a snowball. So it, it's an uphill battle, but we're working on it because we do have examples of systems thinking that we can draw on from all over the world and indeed from our own lives. If you set a plate precariously on the side of a table, all you need to do is set a fork down on the edge of the plate and the plate's going to fall off. That's systems thinking right there, that you can have a huge effect that's caused by a small change. So that's fundamentally what we're asking people to engage with. And why do you think some people are better systems thinkers and some people aren't? One of the big open questions in this field of psychology right now is can systems thinking be taught? And, and how is it, sort of how ingrained is it? You know, is this something that you're born with or you're not born with? Or if you aren't born with, can you be educated to be a good systems thinker? And there's some evidence to show that if I were to give you five or 10 minutes of sort of systems thinking challenges and then present you with a real complex problem that, that you'd have sort of warmed up your mind a little bit and you would do a better job on that complex problem than if I just gave you the problem straight away. But that, that only tells us so much. I guess what, one of the big questions is, is this something where we could envision a future where systems thinking is taught in a science classroom or a math classroom in the same way that we teach calculus or algebra. I mean, one thing I've noticed is that I think that people really crave simple answers for things. And mm. I think it's because it just simply uses up less neurons and less calories in the brain. You know, like to work out a complex equation in your mind is quite hard to do, but just to add, you know, one plus one is, is pretty easy. And I think that's the, just the essential truth to it. But people want to be able to have a clear enemy, a clear answer why. And often when I've been engaging in discussions about just how complex the answers to all these big problems really are. And one thing I've noticed just through doing this podcast and speaking to people is that I ask everybody, like, what's the big thing that needs to change? And every single person says, these are enormously complex issues. There's no one big thing. There are so many different things we need, we need to work on. And these big problems like climate change, I mean, if there was a clear answer, it might have already been solved. It's that there's just so many dimensions to the problem, so many dimensions to every social and environmental problem that is unsolved. My, my point is that I think people want a definitive black and white answer. And that's a, you know, black and white thinking is a standard cognitive bias. And getting people to think in a not black and white way that every single debate, almost everything in the universe is enormously complex shades of gray, just takes up so much more cerebral resources. I think you're, you're spot on to identify that. And absolutely, they are sort of opposite ends of the spectrum. In that when we ask someone to look at a, a problem like climate change, we are asking them to sit down for a moment and really spend some, some cognitive energy on this. And it works for you and I who have spent time thinking and learning about climate change that when we think about climate change, we don't need to rerun through the greenhouse effect and the optical depth of carbon dioxide molecules in the atmosphere and so on. We're just able to be like, oh yeah, I've already thought about that and, and I know. We sort of have our mental cheat sheets and our flashcards. But the first time that we sit down and think about climate change, it's not easy. I remember those classes in university and in graduate school and really, really struggling with that. And we are asking people, many of whom 
don't voluntarily go and pursue science education to grapple with some really difficult stuff. But there's a, a second dimension I wanna point out as well. And that second dimension is that oftentimes what issues like environmental issues are up against is not just black and white thinking, but we're asking people to reflect quite honestly on their own lives and sometimes admit that the choices they make have very real negative consequences, both for themselves or their grandchildren or people on the other side of the world. We have this issue now of cognitive dissonance where people really love going to Hawaii on vacation every year. And someone tells them, hey, your flights to Hawaii are causing flooding in Bangladesh. And it's much easier sometimes for the brain to say, well, I'm just gonna switch off that bit about climate change than to give up those vacations to Hawaii every winter. Well, it's amazing how strongly emotional people can get and even angered they can get by those issues. You know, I've been prodding people on these issues for, for a long time and I feel like I've come to terms that I know if I catch a flight to New York exactly what it is. I just, mm. I know what it is. I'm going to do it anyway if, I, if I'm going to do it. I just feel I have a fairly rational perspective on my own environmental and social footprint, both, both good and bad. But often raising these issues with people that are perhaps unfamiliar with thinking about them can get really, really upset. Um, when I was 16 in my final year of high school, I started putting these little environmental little news bits in our like daily bulletin. We had a daily bulletin that was read out to all the girls in the school. And I would put like a little thing in there. I thought it was really interesting, but it would be like something really negative, like, you know, penguins are, are dying in Antarctica or, or, you know, a polar bear washed up, you know, with its stomach full of plastic. I was like, wow, this is fascinating. Our world is dying. I've got to share this information. And I was completely maligned and hated for it. Everyone in the school hated me. I, they started yelling things out at me in the schoolyard. Like people were like, I don't want to hear when I'm having, you know, like my breakfast at nine o'clock in the morning that some penguin died. You're ruining my life. This came up again when I had a media company. I would kind of like force my employees to watch environmental documentaries once a week. And I would be like, you ruined my weekend, Katie. We don't want to know about some species becoming extinct when I'm about to go out for beers on a Friday night. Anyway, the same kind of thing over and over again where I'm like, hey, do you know about this? Do you know about this? This incredible anger towards me and real negativity about coming to terms with it. Anyway, which is all tying back into this concept that you raised of cognitive dissonance, which is saying that after you show people their environmental impact, they can get really angry and just want to disconnect from it. Well, and I think one of the things that, that you have pointed out, which is so important, is that there's something quite intimate about environmental issues and that they have to do with very personal parts of people's lives, like, you know, what they eat and how they transport themselves and how warm their home is at night. These, these are things that, that I think are, feel quite personal and quite sensitive in a way where Oh, if we're going to talk about foreign policy and you, you want to have a big conversation about foreign policy, fine. I'm not going to feel personally endangered by that. But you suddenly start telling someone that, oh, you know, your choice to eat beef instead of chicken or your choice to drive a big car instead of ride a bike, that is something that I want to politicize. Well, yeah, we need to politicize it. A more sustainable and just and prosperous future requires it, but it is really uncomfortable for people. And people try and come up with little reasons. I can't remember the term in psychology, but it's something that's also, I've seen studies about it in the, in the Journal of Environmental Psychology, about how people come up with these other little reasons. They're like, oh, well, it's all right that I had a steak because like I rode my bike today and I don't use plastic bags. So that's okay if I catch Absolutely. a plane. They're constantly Mor hazard, recalculating. Right? So yeah. we're always coming up with these little, and now that I've read about it, I, I, I've got a, like an ear out for it. Like I hear when people do it all the time. Like my flatmate, I said, oh, you drink, you know, bottled water that comes in glass bottles. You know, glass bottles have five times the environmental impact of plastic and you could just have none and drink tap water. And he was like, I live in a small apartment and I don't drive a car. Right there. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. But I think it just shows like that we really need to study psychology to like figure this stuff out. I mean, like what we were talking about earlier, we just can't continue to really make traction on environmental problems without the field. Yeah, no. I, I think that's spot on. And one of the things that, that I found in my experience doing a lot of this research is that you sort of come into it and, and you're hoping that you're going to find this silver bullet solution. You're going to find, oh, you know, there's this magic six word phrase that you can say to any climate change denier. And suddenly they're going to 
sell their car and start living off grid, whatever. And you realize very quickly that what we're up against with this scale of global environmental issues is much greater than that. It's a good reality check. And it's the reality check that we need. The amount of money that companies like Tesla are spending trying to develop the next big techno technological fix, great, fine. You know, you can make all the lithium ion batteries in the world until there isn't any more lithium in the world. At the end of the day, actually getting to the heart of these issues is gonna require engaging with people in a much more intimate and one-on-one -on -one and sustained way than sitting in a movie theater and watching a 90 minute documentary or showing them an ad over a 90 second television spot for the next sort of green innovation or the best thermostat for your house. But what we're up against is something that is gonna require a long-term conversation with people. I was watching a talk by Steven Pinker. Do you know who Steven mm. Pinker is? Um, yeah. I, I'm a huge fan of his. And he had this wonderful phrase where he said, objective truth is an exotic idea about how, and he was talking specifically about climate change. He said that you can tell how much someone believes or supports climate change by their social identity or their postcode. And it really has nothing to do with the objective facts about climate change. And when you survey people who are very interested in climate change, pro-climate change, and people that are really against it, actually their knowledge is about the same. You know, like how many parts per million in the atmosphere, what people yeah. don't know and don't know is about the same. And it really made me think. I mean, this whole sort of thing I'm trying to do with this whole How to Save the World book and podcast is to bring a data perspective thinking to people, to really bring all of our efforts to save the world down to, to measurement and making sure that we're having measurable results. Because I've seen a lot of people in the environmental movement do stuff that has no measurable results and not really make the connection that they're not an impact on, on the data. Having a data-driven mindset is having a mindset of objective truth, that data is objective. And that means having very shrewd critical thinking skills and mm. rational skills. That systems thinking requires you to think about all of the data, taking into account that all of our progress can ultimately be measured and that we want to make a measurable impact. How do you measure systems thinking in your study? I mean, how, how do you tell whether someone's a systems thinker or not? We, we used a scale. It's, it's called in the most boring way possible, the systems thinking scale. It's a simple a standard psychological instrument, or at least it looks like any other standard psychological instrument. It asks people a bunch of questions and asks for their responses. They Great. say um, political systems thinking, political ideology, acceptance of science, free market okay. ideology, conspiratational ideation. Whoa, that's a big word. Um, risk perception and policy support. So those, those were all of the, the different instruments that we used. So we did uh -huh. measure all of those things, but, uh, but our systems thinking scale was one 15 question instrument. And it asked 15 questions, very general, just about the world. And that was a way for us to gauge how much of a systems thinker someone is. It's certainly not perfect, but, it, but for our uses, it was good enough. And we know that it was good enough because what we found is that depending on whether someone scored high on the scale or low, there were massive shifts in the ways that they responded to the other questions that we asked. So one of the most revealing parts of our data is we asked people, we said, what do you think the, the value is of the total ecosystem services of the planet? And then we also ask them, looking at that value, how much do you think that number has decreased in the last, maybe it was 50 years, because of human action? So what do you think the ecosystem services are, are worth in billions or trillions of US dollars? And then how much of that have we lost? We found even just a really simple median split. So you line up all the people who do our study and you take the top half of systems thinkers and then you take the bottom half of systems thinkers and you compare them. And we found that those top half of people valued the ecosystem services of the world much more than the people at the bottom half. And they valued the, the damage or estimated the damage to be much greater than the people at the bottom half. That's, that's how we know that this scale really does help us to be able to look at these issues. So you found this, this really fascinating insight so for all the people that are designing environmental campaigns and policies, people working in city government, in environmental NGOs, in green certification programs, how can we turn this into something useful? 
I think what we need to do is we need to start developing an environmental discourse that instead of being written by environmental engineers for environmental engineers, is written by environmental engineers for the general public, people who don't spend day in and day out going through the nuts and bolts of really complex systems. And so I think so much of that is, is finding messages that resonate with people and that give people a sense that environmental issues and global environmental change is not some monster up in the hill and that it doesn't necessarily mean that they're bad people if they admit that oh, climate change is happening and I have something to do with it. But I think we need to develop an environmental discourse that's based upon self-efficacy, that empowers people where the amount of empowerment and influence that people have is proportional to the scale of the problem. You think climate change is a big deal? Great. Let me tell you just how much you can do about it. So you mean self-efficacy, what, what do you mean exactly by that phrase? Just how much someone feels that they can change a system. Like their so sense of very, agency. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's mm. so easy to say, oh, well, you know, if I choose not to get on that flight from London to New York, the plane is going to take off anyways. When I have to tell my family why I'm not coming home for Thanksgiving, and I say, I don't want to have those carbon emissions attached to me. They're, they'll tell me, they'll say, Stephen, the plane's taking off anyways. It's exactly the kind of systems thinking that we need to work on to help people understand that even though it might not look like it, obviously me not getting on that plane does have an impact. Because if everyone else is making the same decision, suddenly Virgin Airlines is flying one less flight from London to JFK every day. And that's the beginning of something much larger after that. So everyone needs to feel like they can be, if not the tipping point, then part of this coalition of people that are moving it in the right direction. We can only get 50% of, of people in the United States or the UK to turn out for a big referendum like Brexit or like the presidential election. And it's because the other 50 or 40% of people are sitting it out saying, well, what difference is my vote going to make? And that's what we're up against. Now, I read this study uh, a couple of years ago that said that the concept of self-efficacy or self-agency was the most powerful driver in whether people engaged in environmentally friendly behaviours, much more than how much someone cared about the environment. So basically, you can care a lot about the environment, a huge amount, but if you don't feel that your one action, you know, like remembering a reusable coffee cup or riding your bike, if you just don't feel that that's going to make a difference, you are much less likely to do it than someone who maybe doesn't care about the environment that much. But if you feel it's going to make a difference, you'll be more inclined to do it. Which brings me to this concept of feedback loops, which I'm really excited about. Can you explain how feedback loops or what they mean in systems thinking, systems theory? I think, I think the easiest place to start is everyone's been at a concert and someone points the microphone in the wrong direction and suddenly you get this loud noise in everyone's, in everyone's ears. What's happening is the sort of background sound that's coming out of the speakers is going into the microphone. It's getting amplified through the speakers and back into the microphone and so on and so on and so on until you have this incredibly loud noise that fills a room. A feedback loop is anything that takes something small and it dials it up and it spins it out of control and it feeds back on itself. It feeds back on itself. There are actually wonderful examples in the physics and geology of climate change. Like if you melt the ice on Greenland, then Greenland actually absorbs more heat because ice is reflective. And Greenland absorbs more heat and gets hotter and more ice melts. And so Greenland absorbs more heat and so on and so forth. Oh, that must be another part of the feedback loop because I always thought of feedback loops as just like showing you the numbers, like a Fitbit is showing you how many steps you took. It's just like a data feed of communication. Ah. No, I think, I think the, the, where that fits into it, the classic example is motivation can lead to better results and better results can lead to more motivation, uh -huh. which leads to better results and so on and so forth. So if you look at your Fitbit, you go, oh yeah, 3,000 steps today. And then you do 3,100 the next day. Yeah, okay, I'm going to do 3,200 the day after that. And so on and so forth. Uh, so you get the information and that sort of enhances the whole, the whole thing. Well, where I'm going with this is uh, what you talked about, about self-efficacy, is that when mm -hmm. I think we have 
I think it's a real missing link is having better feedback loops of just the communication of the data to people. So when people can see the numbers uh, in real time, real-time feedback loops of numbers, then they'll, that will be able to enhance their feeling of self-efficacy. That's just how I, I'm starting to see a big trend of with more, um, you know, sensors measuring environmental data, putting it on in places where people can see it. So have you noticed this trend of getting, getting more data about the earth, people being able to see it, and then that being able to turn into this kind of self-efficacy feedback loop trend? Absolutely. And, and it's funny you bring it up because at Oberlin, one of the, the other researchers in the department, John Peterson, has been really at the cutting edge of this idea of, he calls it the environmental dashboard. So what if you were to install in every single building, not even just a smart meter like you have in someone's home, but in fact, a dashboard that says, okay, this is how much electricity you're using. Now let me show you where it's actually coming from in real time, whether it's coming from solar panels, whether it's coming from the natural gas station down the road or what have you. So John's work on this, I think, has been really, really interesting. And, and a big question, and this is the question that everyone is wondering, is how much can that influence behavior? Because at what point do you get to, to this stage where you have this beautiful LCD display in your home every time you walk in the door and suddenly you stop really seeing it? So obviously that first week, that first month, it is really cool and you're engaged, but does it become a part of your routine? Do you, before you decide what to cook for dinner, figure out if your power is coming from the hydroelectric dam or the coal plant? And is that going to choose whether, is that going to make the decision about whether you have a hot dinner or a cold one? That's the question that, that everyone's asking. And obviously we need to pursue it because certainly the self-efficacy bit feeds in so well to this question of, giving people the data. If they can say, by reading this email, you save this much of a tree. There's a lot to be said for that in terms of giving people sort of concrete results from their actions. We just need to find the best way to deliver that information. Yeah, I'm totally fascinated by, by that that area. I actually produced a course called How to Save the World with Gamification, which has a whole lot of those design using, you know, progress bars, using color, using like emotive animals. You know, if you use an animal that smiles, you're more likely to do the thing that if you have an animal that has no expression, like all these, all these little things. Uh, and there are a number of companies doing this and they are getting they're definitely getting results. But I suppose the question is, like, let's say once we have all this data and all of these screens, maybe they can shave off 10% or 20%. I mean, in some studies I've seen, you know, the change is enormous. It's even multiples of 30 times or reduction of 70%. But where do you go from there? I mean, ultimately, people will become sort of immune to it. You might need to be constantly, like, updating it to make it more novel. But I suppose I think we're still at the really early stages of developing these environmental dashboards. So that's maybe a problem that we haven't had yet. You know, we can probably make a lot of change first, and then maybe 10 years we'll be having the conversation, well, you know, how do we optimise it? Well, and, and you're right, too, that it's good to start small. I mean, it's good to start with a little sign over the, the garbage can that says everything you throw in here ends up at the landfill at such and such place. You know, really make it clear to people that their actions have consequences, even if it's something as simple as throwing out a disposable coffee cup. So connecting that behavior to consequences is huge. And at the same time, we should be pushing farther ahead. I have a friend who works on transport economics. And he's talked about what if you incentivize the developers over at Google to always suggest when you plug something into Google Maps to suggest a, uh, a public transit route first rather than defaulting to a car. What if Google began saying these are the carbon emissions associated with your journey today? We have all different, all different ways of building this stuff in. And, and I think that absolutely we do need to start small. It's gonna look like a switch uh, or a little label by every light switch that you know says something about, please turn this off when you're done. But we need to ratchet this forward because we all know that the clock is ticking. We don't have 200 years to figure this out. Yeah, actually the quotes from the woman, I, I think her name's Rebecca Moore, who founded or co-founded Google Earth, talks a lot about this idea as a, a dashboard for the planet and getting more and more environmental data and feeding that into the Google Earth engine. You're a school teacher. I How am. Do well, you... <laughs> I've been a school teacher for three months now. Okay. Considering that, let's say critical thinking, such an important issue to teach to young people, how to think about data, about systems thinking. How do you think we can teach kids critical thinking 
so they can become these systems thinkers that consider global issues in perspective? I think that the answer is a little bit and often. I teach geography, which in the US is pretty much unheard of at the secondary level. No one, no one studies geography in, in US secondary schools. But I'm really lucky because I, I get to teach feedback loops in my classes. Five or six weeks ago, I was teaching feedback loops to a classroom of 13 year olds. We were critically looking at, we were looking in this context at global development. So is the human development index a good way to measure development? And the way that I help them look critically at an issue like that is I present two totally different sides of an issue. Very sort of orthodox, oh yes, the human development index, this is what we need. And on the other side, we look at a, a very critical voice. What I hope to teach these students, I absolutely, I, I kick it off with them at around that sort of, in England, it's, they call it year eight, but you know, it's the 12, 13 year old mark, is that almost every side has two issues to it. Almost every side has two issues. And that we absolutely need to be able to see both of these sides. And so part of it is media literacy, which is, a, I think, a precondition for critical thinking. If you're not able to, to tell good information from bad, it's very difficult to be critical of it. But then I think it's to always be reading, always be listening with part of your mind asking, what if this is totally wrong? And, and what would the other possibility look like? And so we spend all of our time imagining different possibilities and trying to turn the world on its head or to the left or to the right and to see what it looks like in a different orientation. Now, it's so interesting that you bring that up because one of the things I wanted to raise with you that in your study, you found that a conspirational, um, am I saying it right? Conspirational? Con uh, no. conspiracist. conspiracist? Conspiratorial, idea. sorry, conspiratorial mindset, someone who believes in conspiracies is completely yes. opposite to systems thinking. And you brought up free market ideology, like people that blindly believe in free market, which is what we would yeah. call it the deep right or the libertarian movement, which is kind of strong in Silicon Valley, that the market will solve absolutely everything. The, the extreme right really love that worldview. But you, I feel like you also see the same thing on the left, like for example, in the, you know, the very deep vegan movement, which is everything has to be vegan and, and animals and we can't hurt one feather on, on one chicken and, and meat is, is really, really bad. And you, you end up with this very black and white tunneled thinking, which seems to be the enemy of systems thinking and also the enemy of creating solutions like yes. the kind of really good solutions that are going to work i mean how do you see the relationship between being able to get out of this almost cult-like thinking that that's kind of the enemy of the type of creativity we need to really solve the world's problems i think it's just openness to being wrong and and i think it's it's a, a self-reflective attitude that says why do i want to believe this and so, you know, we love to make fun of the right for the political right for denying climate change. And we should make fun of them a little bit because it's really quite damaging that they do. But the left is just as guilty. The way that, that people on the left, and you live in San Francisco, and, you know, you have friends in San Francisco like this, and I have San friends in San Francisco like this, who refuse to eat genetically modified crops. Although the I have more is... friends in San Francisco who will only eat genetically modified crops because they're like the biohacker, like really sciencey, edgy types. Good, good for them. <laughs> and, and it's true that no one has ever been able to produce a good, a good piece of scientific evidence that suggests that GM organisms are, are not safe for human consumption. And yet in, in, I think, the entire European Union, they are banned. You cannot find in the EU GMO crops available for human consumption. You can't find them. It's had a real influence on policy. And then you also have the anti-vaxxers on the left who think that vaccines cause autism, which we know is junk science and is really damaging. It harms children, it harms children who have been vaccinated and it harms children who aren't vaccinated. And I think so much of it is that, okay, so what is it about people on the far left that makes them want to get spooked out about genetically modified organisms? Well, it's consistent with their worldview. These are the same people who traditionally have, have been protesting nuclear power. And that's a whole different issue that, that we don't need to get into, but it fits within the rest of the way that they want to see the world. But they don't ask themselves, am I believing this because it fits with everything else I believe? 
Am I believing this because it's convenient? Am I believing this because it makes me feel right about all of the other things that I believe? They're not asking that. And, and that's what we need to be looking at. We need to say, why, what's going on inside my head that makes me feel more drawn to this position than that position? It's essentially when people are, have an inclination or a craving towards this conspiratorial thinking, this black and white thinking that shuts off their capacity for systems thinking and is going to shut off their ability to see what's perhaps what's really going on, to shut off their ability, their openness to new innovations. So much of it is that, is that the thinking that happens that leads people down these, these conspiratorial avenues, and this is really relevant for environmental thinking, is they're not out fundamentally to discover what's true. They're out to feel right about something. Yeah, which brings me back to that Steven Pinker quote of that objective truth is, a, is an exotic idea. People want to make a, a worldview based on the tribe that they're around rather than seeking the absolutely. kind of the absolute truth. But I, I love the way you just distilled it down into asking the question, what if I'm wrong? I mean, it's such a simple question, but it, you just said it really well. Is your advice that we all just need to ask, what if I'm wrong, a lot more? I think we need to do it so much that it becomes a habit. I think it just has to be total second nature that when we're presented with information we need to ask what if this is wrong and when we're presented with information that conflicts with things that we believe we need to ask well what if i'm wrong i really do think that this is learnable even though i'm not a not a teacher i think back through my own life cycle of learning and i'm definitely much more that way now at 37 years old than I was when I was 21 or when I was 16. Every year I learn more and I think I definitely chip away more of that. I definitely know what's right and what's wrong in the world and yeah. become more humble and more open to different ways of seeing things. I, I think it's a shame that critical thinking and systems thinking isn't taught at school. I think it could very easily be taught to every 14 and 15 year old and I don't think it is part of the school curriculum. This is frankly, why I'm in education right now. I spent my time as a research psychologist and I loved it and was interesting. And I, I just had to find out for myself, okay, what can we do with these insights? You know, obviously there are different ways to look at it, but I kind of wanted to go to ground zero. I wanted to say, what happens if I'm spending time day in and day out with young people? And I want to see if, if it is possible to sort of as best as I can help give them the skills that will prepare them to enter a world where they're being told lots of different contradictory information and they're hearing it every which way. And this is one thing I love to ask everybody. I mean, what is the thing that moves you most deeply that gets you most excited about what you do? Right now, it is 100% when I'll be having a class and a student will say something that is just so clear and incisive and insightful, that it makes me feel deeply hopeful that the future we're moving into could be a better one than sometimes we imagine. I suppose you know when you're having this impact on this person's life at this young stage that you can have these fairly profound conversations with them and that they could go into a, a much more, I wouldn't say different, but more enlightened life path. I mean, that's your own feedback loop, right? Happening right it there is. in your work. And young people have a creativity about them and a willingness to think in different and dynamic ways that I think once you get back to the university age, people become a little more inflexible and they become a little more afraid to think boldly. I think this is the time if we're going to find ways to create good environmental global citizens. It's gonna to be to give them the skills that they need to do that kind of critical thinking and that kind of systems thinking. Times like high school is the time that it's gonna happen. Yeah, I think adolescence and high school is often a maligned time as being this awful time of puberty, but I don't think it's a bad time. I think it's a really exciting time. I mean, when I remember my age between being about 12 years old and being about 17, I remember being the most excited and creative and my mind just expanding in this way that I, I've never experienced at any other time in my life. And I don't think that was just, just me. I think everyone's going through this phase of extreme growth. Your mind just sort of opens into adulthood for the first time. And it's a, it's a really special time that I think we need to take much more seriously with young people than just be like, oh, you're covered in acne and getting pubic hairs. Just, just shut up and don't get pregnant, don't get on drugs. It's sort of how we kind of like wrap that age up now. 
Well, and I think, I think we're quick to dismiss the, the emotional content of that time as well. You know, we sort of see teenagers as moody, but what if we saw teenagers instead as hyper empathetic? What, what if we saw them as these deeply feeling people? Suddenly we would look to them and be like, wow, what if I could be that empathetic? What if I could be that sensitive? And certainly that, that is something that we need more of in our, in our day-to-day practices. We all need that. Well, I think it is. You know, I remember working on battery hen things when I was that age and working on mm. raising money for starving children in Africa. And I, I mean, we, not just me, all of our group that was into it, we were all in high school. We really cared about these hens. Like we were all <laughs> really upset about the hens and we were really upset about the starving children in Africa. I say now, I don't feel that way anymore. I mean, I kind of intellectually care, but there's just so much to do and there's so many things in the world. It's kind of gone. But Mm. we were deeply empathetic, not just moody. So, I mean, it's a really beautiful way to characterise it. I hope lots of people listen and hear that. It's really cool. (laughs) Just to finish up, if there was one bit of advice that you could give all of the people that are going to be listening who work in you know, professional environmental sustainability for how they can use the insights that you found around system thinking into their communications, what, what would it be? What would you advise them? Most people don't think like you do. They don't. Go find those people and have conversations with them. Don't try to get inside their minds, but just listen to what they're saying and listen to what they believe, because these are the people who we need to get on board. And the ideas and the emotions and the sympathies that get us all out of bed in the morning to go to the office and work as city planners or environmental engineers or technologists are not going to be the same sympathies that are going to bring everyone else on board with us. It seems to be that everybody who is really motivated thinks that what motivated them will motivate everybody else, but that's not really how it works. And in so many of these conversations I've been having, this issue of that mindset is just coming up over and over again. It really does seem to be, I think, whether the cutting edge of sustainability is or from what I'm seeing now. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, Steve. And this has been a wonderful conversation about trying to understand the deep workings of the mind to do with systems thinking and systems theory about how we can get people to more emotionally and psychologically engage with environmental issues. If you would like to listen to this podcast on YouTube, you can find it on How to Save the World on the YouTube channel. You can also find it on iTunes. And don't forget to sign up to my website, katiepatrick.com, for more free resources and videos about how you can use data, design, gamification, a whole bunch of stuff to help turn your dreams for a better world into real and measurable change.